Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last YCEI talk of the year. And I'm pleased to introduce Turi Searling back to Yale after, what, 25 years? Um, Turi is coming from the University of Utah, and uh, he's been there since 1979. Uh, and he studied um, the geochemistry or geochemical records of changes in ecosystems. Uh, related to changes in climate uh, and, and looking at changes in both plants and animals. Um, and today he'll be talking about uh, environments of human evolution um, via isotopic evidence, uh, I imagine, from East Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hagid. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Again, I think the last time I was here was probably about 10 years ago. And I'd been here many times before that. And I've always enjoyed my visits. And you know, as with everybody else in the room, I'm sorry that Carl's not here, because uh, I'd, I'd love to have his feedback. Uh, can, he was always willing to give it. Uh, um, so, um, so if there's been a unifying theme of my research over the years, uh, it, it might be related to evolution of, of humans. I first went to East Africa as an undergraduate uh, working in the Turkana Basin. And um, I've been there a number of times uh, since. And one of the things that um, I uh, have been interested in all along is in geochemistry. And one of the... Uh, the, sort of the spirit of this talk will be uh, in, in how I've tried to approach answering a bunch of the questions that, that keep being posed in paleoanthropology uh, by, by, by my paleoanthropology colleagues. Um, and so we'll go from there. And um, I'll just start out remembering that one of the things that I really loved about listening to Carl talk was that he always tried in his lectures to uh, make sure there was something for everybody in the room. And so, you know, for those of you who have never seen anything about isotopes, uh, this is what we're dealing with, are the stable isotopes. Um, most of the carbon on the planet is stable carbon-12, and a little bit is carbon-13 at about 1.1%. And there's a tiny bit of the other stuff, which isn't important. And it's just simply due to the difference in neutrons in the in the carbon nucleus. And the terminology is the normal delta C13 terminology. And the ratio of whatever it is we're interested in compared to whatever standard we're using. And on Earth, remember that the total range is about, is in the second decimal place. Uh, and, and our units on Earth range, we, the delta C13 ranges from about minus 65 to about minus plus or to about plus 25 per mil. And, um, and the main target of my talk today, or the main subject, will be carbon isotopes. And I'd like to put it in the context of human evolution. This is a, a diagram taken off the web of somebody's representation of human evolution, starting with an early hominin, uh, in this case, Artipithecus, at about four and a half or so million years ago, and the humans having split off from the chimpanzees somewhere down here. And as we march up the geological record, we come to Australopithecus onamensis and then Afarensis and Platyopsis stuck over here, but some people might stick it in the same line. Off in the direction to some really robust Australopithecines, Australopithecine boisei or Paranthesis boisei, and the robustus, which is the South African similar creature. And then a bunch of Homo. Uh, species, again, depending on how many people or who's making the diagram. Uh, and the one thing I learned in geochemistry is just keep out of that business. Uh, just tell a geochemical story and you'll make enough enemies without offering opinions as to which species is which. But it leads up eventually to us. And in East Africa, uh, we have most of the fossils that can be well dated. And the question that constantly comes up is what does the environment look like? 
And here's just uh, several environments across Africa ranging from a fairly open grassland to uh, coastal forests. And uh, one of the questions is, well, what is the environments in which the, the humans were living or the early hominins were living and so on? And there's lots of people that I can thank. And there's a, many of those are graduate students, uh, people with the National Museums of Kenya and so on, and a bunch of different organizations that have helped um, fund the research um, over the years in various sorts of ways. So um, we'll start with the fossils. Um, it's kind of gratifying in looking at this uh, collection of fossils that of all of these skulls, uh, only this one was found before I went to East Turkana. This one was found in uh, 1969. And when I, as an undergraduate, took a course in evolution, um, you know, none of, these, none of these guys had yet been found. And so it's been uh, gratifying seeing how this system is built up. And this is just an, another early hominin without his skull. Um, here's the geology of the basin is extraordinary. Um, this is uh, in the Shungura formation and this ridge on the skyline and that ridge on that skyline are both layers of volcanic ash. This is a two meter layer of volcanic ash. And these layers of volcanic ash provide us uh, with the chronology that, uh, that, that, that we can use. And um, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of geology in this room. Here's a couple of the other people in the, in the, in, in, in the group, uh, Meeve and Richard Leakey, uh, myself and Frank Brown with an anthill for scale, a couple of former students, Ben Passy, Naomi Levin, uh, Berkhet Hyleb, uh, and uh, also John Harris and Ian McDougall. Uh, here's the geology of the basin. Uh, it's, it's fairly large. Uh, lake Turkana is, is this large lake here. And look now, because this lake is probably going to be gone in the next 10 years. There's some gigantic sugarcane developments going on in the lower Omo Valley with a lot of people being displaced and a large dam uh, being built. And it's, uh, uh, I, I think this lake will probably be gone or almost completely gone in about 20 years. Um, uh, seismic data tells us that there's up to three or four kilometers worth of sediments in some parts of the basin. So this is in the northern end of the lake. Uh, but there's a lot of outcrop space, all of this yellow stuff pretty much is the is the is is most of the outcrop with the and so again here's the this this part here is the lake okay and we've got some outcrops on the margins and then we have some outcrops down the axial uh, drainage of the Omo River so the Omo River drains the Ethiopian highlands yeah, it's about a quarter the size of the Blue Nile and uh, flows into the Turkana Basin where it evaporates into nothingness. Um, uh, and the long scale, uh, this is a large volcano that was built about 2 million years ago. So prior to 2 million years ago, this was a primarily a fluvial system that then drained out to the Indian Ocean. Since this drainage blockage occurred, uh, there's been periodic capture and diversion over to the Nile uh, River system. So it's kind of switched in and out of this basin for about the last two million years. Um, for scale, uh, this is the field area. And over on this side, I've put all of the gasoline stations where you have to where, that, that, that make, so that, that, uh, make logistics difficult. I think that's the easy way. So think of trying to do field work in this area with only a single gas station at your availability. And actually, a large lake in between, and a border between two countries that don't get along, and a third country, South Sudan, is kind of in here as well. So there are kind of some interesting logistical challenges 
um, to think about. And then lastly, in perspective, here's the size of the basin. And I've kind of circled, this is the entire outcrop of Olduvai Gorge and all of the principal outcrops in the uh, Awash in Ethiopia. And at the same scale is the Turkana Basin. So uh, all of the other sites can easily fit into just this Kubifora outcrop area or the Nachakui or the Lower Omo uh, and so on. So it's a it's kind of a large uh, area to work out the geology and again logistics um, make, it make it interesting. What helps us out terrifically are these layers of volcanic ash like this one here and uh, uh, using uh, originally I, I started working with Frank Brown on the correlation of volcanic ashes and I found it frankly very tedious and I'm just glad that Frank has carried on for very many years and uh, has been able to correlate many uh, ashes within the basin and outside the basin. This is just an example of one volcanic ash uh, which we can find in the Turkana Basin in the sediments. It's also been found, we've found the source area of the volcano. It's been found in the Awash. It's been found out in the Gulf of Aden and in the Western Pacific Ocean. It's been found down at Lake Baringo and it's been found in the, uh, in the Albertine Rift over in Lake Albert. So this is kind of the extent of the layers of volcanic ash and they provide nice timelines. And again, a perspective, uh, perhaps at least to graduate students, um, is we're looking for these pumices and they provide the material which we can date. And when I was a graduate student, we had to fill up this entire bottle with these little crystals. And now we can date single crystals. And that makes not only life a lot easier, it means that there's a lot of things that we can date that we couldn't date before. So over the years, we've developed a exquisite chronology and uh, the red dots uh, spread out through these various sections just so all of, the, um, all of the ashes which we've been able to date and the black oblongs just show various paleomagnetic intervals. And there's been a few ashes that have been traced into the deep sea like these two that have no isotopic date, but we can constrain the age based on the, on the orbital tuning of the deep sea records. So, and taken all together, there's about uh, 200 or 250 layers of volcanic ash that we can correlate between section and section. So we have an exquisite um, opportunity to look at, um, to look at evolution in this case, evolution of, of, of humans. And I should mention that a number of these have been tied into other sites such as the Awash Valley in Ethiopia. There's probably about 10 or 15 volcanic layers that uh, also help constrain the ages of that system. Uh, so there's the, these various sites that I'll be talking about um, today. So the question that we always get as geologists and we've been getting from our colleagues for a long time is how hot is it and and until a few years ago in the terrestrial the the in the terrestrial record often it was hotter than this or less hot and likewise oh it was it was wetter than now or drier and what did animals eat? This is usually based on morphology. Um, what kind of vegetation was present? And I was at Olduvai Gorge with a colleague who picked up a stone tool and he looked at the stone tool and he looked at me and he said, was the hominid who made this sitting in the shade? And I said, oh my God, he wants to know if it was a shady day. And I looked at him and I said, Rob, if you can tell me the time of day, I can tell you if he was sitting in the shade. <laughs> okay, so it's his job now to figure out the time of day, 
But I still have left with this problem of how much shade. So what I want to talk about is using isotopes to look at ecology in the tropics. And we're going to use our good friend carbon-13. And we're going to look at C3 and C4 plants. And we've done lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds of C3 and C4 plants from Africa. And we get these two, these two modes of stable isotope values, which are the C3 and the C4 plants. So this is a collection of C3 plants. And this in front of the elephants is a collection of C4 plants with a little concentration of C3 plants running in a linear line down, the, down that stream valley. So let's recall that the C3 plants are the early photosynthetic pathway on Earth, something like 3 billion years old. Um, it's most, not all, but most dicots. So when you plant a bean and it comes up and it has two leaves, that means it's a dicot. Um, it's the cool season grasses. So um, that's like Kentucky bluegrass in my yard, which is just doing very well right now. And when you go to the grocery store, it's the vegetables, the fruits, the beans. And then these grasses, wheat, barley, and rye, are C3 grasses. And an animal that eats C3 plants looks in isotope space like a C3 plant. And then the C4 plants are the tropical grasses and sedges. And these two things kind of need to go together. We need to have a monthly temperature with enough moisture for a growing season. So it has to be hot in the summer. Okay? And then we'll get C3 grasses and sedges favored. So it's pretty rare in dicots that if we go to, again to the grocery store, maize, corn, sorghum, sugarcane, go to the specialty market, part of the grocery store, millet, teff, phonio. And then if you go to the meat counter and you buy Tyson's chicken and you run it through the mass spectrometer, you find it just looks like a bunch of corn. Okay, Tyson's chicken everywhere in the United States looks like it's just corn. <clears throat> OK, so shade, what can we do to answer this question about shade? The first question that we want to look at. So can we quantify shade? This is part of the talk is the isotope composition of shade. Uh, so here's three scenes from Africa. One is about 1% and about 20 and basically 100% woody cover. So I'm just going to redefine the variables and we'll just call shade woody cover. Okay, so woody cover is something that we can that we can actually measure. So that's woody cover, this is woody cover, that bush in the background up there is woody cover. And of course everything here is woody cover. And so perhaps we can use that to, um, to help us. So basically shade, we've now made this into a binary. Instead of calling it C3 and C4, we'll just call it shade and this plus this is not shade. Okay, and, uh, and we can see what we come up with. So what we did in a number of sites following the work of Michael Bird, we looked at about uh, 76 sites from the tropics. About 35 of these are from, the, from Africa. And then also using some sites where Michael has done a lot of work in North and Australia, in Zambia and Malaysia. So we just take all of these sites together and try to quantify the stable isotope composition. And we'll look at what we can call gap samples, where we collect samples between the gaps in the canopy. And we'll collect a bunch of samples from underneath the canopies and measure the crown canopy in the field. And it turns out we can use, we, we've measured it a bunch of ways. We measure it by measuring it in the field. We can measure it from satellite photography. We can measure it using uh, upward looking cameras. And they all give essentially the same, the same 
that the, the, the same value for the percent canopy cover or percent shade covering the landscape. And uh, conveniently, it turns out that the isotope composition of what's in these gap areas and actually what's under the canopies are actually rather similar. And with some thought, it's actually not that surprising. You can imagine as we make this gap smaller and smaller and smaller, then actually the environment that is underneath this very small area between the gaps is rather similar to underneath the canopy. And likewise, as we expand this gap, we see that there's more and more sunlight could get into open trees. And so we find that, in fact, they turn out to have not identical, but similar values. And then we can uh, measure from satellite imagery the percent canopy and percent open area and use these isotope values to get an overall isotope value of the ecosystem or of the soil. So this is just an example, 1%, uh, 21, and 99% woody cover. And um, we had about 35 sites sprinkled around Africa from coastal forests, mountain forests, deserts, grasslands, ecosystems, so whatever, whatever we could find. And in fact, uh, it turned out that um, most of these sites actually had been chosen for a different reason. So we kind of think of them almost as not quite as random samples, but, um, but the original selection for each of these sites was actually for a different project, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, anyway, so we have many, many sites. We can get the delta C13 of pure C4 ecosystems and a pure C3 ecosystems, and we can fit it to uh, an arc sine transformation. So we end up with this S sort of a curve. And one of the interesting things is we have very few C4 plants until the woody cover is less than about 70%. And uh, that's basically, uh, as we'll see, it's because uh, you actually, the soils in, in the environments don't really get really, really hot, which is what one of the things that C4 plants are adapted to uh, when you have extensive woody cover. So we can calculate uh, a probability density function for a given delta C13 value. So for instance, this delta C13 value gives us a distribution function. And so what mostly what I'm going to talk about is what these uh, distribution functions um, look like. So we can um, now go to the fossil record and we use fossil soils and it was actually uh, was one of the earlier projects I started working on in East Africa was the fossil soils but without the woody cover uh, in ocean. And here's two different sequences of fossil soils. Uh, the Shungura in green and the Nachakui Kubifora formation in red. And this is, I forget how many fossil soils this is, but it's a lot, <coughs> um, several hundreds. Um, one of the things that we notice is that, okay, the Shungura formation is in the axial trough of the Turkana Basin, where the Omo River is today. And this is, we see that for the early part of the record, it's much, much more wooded than the marginal stream. So Nachakui and Kubifora are both on the, on the edges of the basin, are marginal streams flowing into the, into the trunk stream, Omo trunk stream. At about 1.8 or so million years ago, they seem to come together. This is after the building of the big volcano edifice, okay? So at about this point is when there's a drastic change in basin configuration. And we see throughout this whole sequence that we never really have closed forest. We do have some of this forest woodland habitats, a lot of the wooded grassland habitats, and we never actually see any pure open grassland habitats. And we can quantify these things because 
of the convenience of satellite imagery. And so 20% open cover actually looks like this. 40% looks like this, 65 like that, and essentially 80% looks like that. So uh, this gives us, we can probably say that, well, all of this area in here during the Nachikui and Kubi-4 formation is probably something like this. Early Shungura, probably something more like that in terms of the habitats available. And we can go through the whole geological uh, record in both the Awash in Ethiopia and the Trakana Basin and do all the paleosols and see what we get. So this lighter blue here is the Shungura and the darker blue is the Nachikui Kubifora formation. And so we see that kind of early on, it, it actually appears like it more been more open, became somewhat more closed, and then somewhat more uh, open again. But never do we actually have true open grasslands uh, in the same is kind of true in the, uh, in the um, Awash. It's more open, becomes a little more closed, but still fairly open, and then more open again. And never, ever, ever do we actually find any paleosol evidence for true forest. And, uh, and that's what the paleosols are telling us. Uh, another thing we could do is take all 1,400 almost paleosol values, or 1,400 when I, or 1,380 when I made the slide, and kind of see what this distribution is like. And this is now. We can parse this into woody dicots, C4 grasses, and then the contribution of the C3 forbs and herbs to these, to these landscapes. And um, and we see that about 25% might be called grasslands, where grasslands, the technical African definition of grasslands is from about 0 to 10 percent woody cover. So this is 10 percent woody cover. And these both are, would be grasslands. We see that by far the dominant environment recorded in fossil soils. Uh, oh, and I, I'm going to back up one here. If this lets me back it up, it won't let me back it up. How do I back up? Um, this total is about 25%, but it turns out that actually most of these are from less than about a million years old. So it appears that the grassland is the prevalence. Of this, this is a kind of an overestimate for most of the time period I'm talking about. <clears throat> it appears that there's more grassland now from the, fossil, from the paleocell record now than there ever has been in Africa. OK, most of it was between 10 and 40 percent woody cover, those kinds of landscapes. And if you're a hominid thinking about food, this is what you need to be thinking. This is the most important environment. This is the most abundant environment available. And if you're a hominid thinking of running away from, so you wouldn't get eaten, it's the same place. Um, and a few 15 or so percent are this sort of habitat. Most of these are actually from the Shungura Formation. Uh, and we have essentially no evidence for forest, Okay, less than 1%. And actually, it represents less than one paleosol. So we have essentially no evidence in the fossil record for what would be a true forest. Maybe they're there, but um, um, they're not in the things that preserve paleosols. So this is just three different sites that I've put in just to compare. A site called Kanjera, that's actually not outside the Turkana Basin, a site called Aramis, and a site called Canapoy to show you the, the probability density that the paleosol says. Canapoy looks like something like this, uh, basically a woodland, shrubland, bushland. Aramis is much, much more open, and Kanjera is extremely more open. 
and the kinds of environments that those represent in real pictures look something like this, this for Aramis, and this for Canjera or for Canapoy, and uh, and that's what the, that's what the paleosols are telling uh, based on the isotopes. Okay, and again from the top view, useful if you're thinking about what it takes to get away from anything. These are paired um, photographs or paired images. So this is a Google image from that site, Google from that site, and so on to give you the sense of what the landscapes are like. So lastly, um, we, I've done a survey. This is of the present Omo River. It's, okay, the axial, okay, the, what's shaded in, or what, what's, what's shaded is outside the depositional basin. Everything inside the gray is in the active depositional region of the Omo River today. So we have this axial marginal, this axial meander plain. Here's old meanders from the Omo River. So the Omo is meandering from here to here. This is actually four meters below this. Okay. So if there's uh, if there's a flood, this entire area will become flooded, and we'll get a small amount of de sediments deposited. Likewise, much of this is actually lower than the levee. So the levees on the modern river are three to four meters high. And as we go down further, we get into some other stuff. The active delta is down to the south. This particular image that I have is about 5% riparian forest. It's about 15% bushland, which is represented mainly by this. It's about uh, 50 or so percent wooded grassland. And it's got about 30% or so true grassland. Uh, that's out in this area, uh, which is actually rather similar to what we just looked at in the fossil soils. OK. So we've, we've actually been able to say something now, something about the landscape in, in terms of the, of the uh, ecosystems. And I'm going to now get into the problem of how hot, what can we say about temperature? And, uh, and here's two sites, uh, Nakuru, Kenya, mean annual temperature of about 17 degrees Celsius. Turkana, mean annual temperature of 29 degrees. This is what it looks like today. Uh, OK. Uh, where were the guys that made these tools? OK. What was the driving environmental uh, factors for whether they decided to be in the shade or not? Well, maybe we can find out from the soils. Here's a map of the world, OK, uh, just put into a bunch of different places. And the mean annual temperature, uh, New York City or New Haven, Connecticut is right about here. Uh, Death Valley is right about here. There's a bunch of places hotter than Death Valley. Lake Turkana is actually in this um, last little tiny box. Okay, so if we drive around the world and collect the mean annual temperature of everywhere, we find out that today Lake Turkana is in the hottest 0.1% of the spots on Earth in terms of mean annual temperature. There are places that get hotter daily temperatures, but for mean annual temperature, uh, it's pretty hot. Um, a couple years ago, I was there during, uh, it rained at night, and I remember we got up, and the local people in our camp were all standing around shivering in blankets, and the temperature was 70 degrees, <laughs> 70 Fahrenheit. Um, OK, so um, our friend here is the clumped isotope thermometer, which uh, I know a lot of you should be familiar with here. Um, it's a key part of our story. We remember that the isotope thermometer was invented because Harold Urey in 1947 presented a talk in which he described this chemical reaction, which involved the exchange of oxygen 18 and water, 
with oxygen 16 and calcium carbonate. And he pointed out that if you could measure the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16 in calcite and the oxygen 18 to 16 ratio in water, you, this was an equilibrium constant and because everything, all equilibrium constants are functions of temperature, this meant that there was a thermometer and so this made geologists very happy until they really, especially those of us working on land, kept bashing our head against things saying, well, we just don't know what the isotope composition of water is, so we're kind of stuck. <clears throat> and so John Eiler came up with this elegant equation on top, calcite plus calcite goes to calcite plus calcite, which even non-geochemists can love until we label it. And when we notice the labels that really are appropriate, we see what we're really interested in is keeping track of all of the different species of isotope exchange. So this has only, only one peculiar isotope, oxygen 18. This one has only one peculiar one, carbon 13. This one has no peculiar isotopes, and this one has two. So we just need to keep track of those. And because everything is a function of temperature, if it's an equilibrium constant, well, voila, we have another magic thermometer. And in soils, the key reaction is calcium carbonate forms to some mechanism uh, and related to the chemistry of the soil. So we just need to measure everything, and this is uh, uh, getting to be more commonplace. It had not been done 10 years ago, had not been done. But so this is the notion of the clumped carbonate paleothermometer, and the notion is, as you should, should know, or if you don't, spend a lot of time talking to Hagit, and she'll tell you all of the details. We look at the delta, the difference between the measured value and a random, a randomized value, and we find that it's a very laborious small scale. It's only a 0.2 per mil difference for our entire temperature range, and so this is a laborious measurement, but we can do it now. And so now we move to Lake Turkana. And uh, so uh, some years ago, after, when Ben Passy was finishing his thesis with me, I uh, convinced him and John Eiler at the same time it would be good if Ben would go work in, in John Eiler's lab. And so uh, this is work was done with, uh, with uh, Ben Passy and also with Naomi Levin, who was involved in some of the paleosol work we were working on. So we're interested in these soil carbonates. These soil carbonates form at depth. They're always below, they form below about 20 to 30 centimeters within soils. And what that means is that it's the soil temperature they're measuring. They could record the soil temperature down here, not the soil temperature at the surface. And the daily soil temperature down here is very small, okay? So our results were as follows. This is the mean annual temperature of Lake Turkana. Every fossil soil except two said that it was much hotter, a lot hotter, up to 10 degrees Celsius hotter, okay? So this led us to be a bit worried. Either there's something wrong with our understanding uh, with the thermometer or something. So what our response was, buy a bunch of these little hobo gizmos and stick them in the soil and see what happens. So this is our first profile that we measured over not quite a year. And we see that, so the gray shaded area is the air temperature. The blue is at 25 centimeters and the black is at 50 centimeters. And what we see is that in the rainy season, we get soil, or we get the temperature dropping, and this is when we add water, and we increase, uh, the plant activity increases, so PCO2 goes up. Both of those promote soil uh, 
Uh, both of those promote uh, carbonate dissolution. Then we see that as the growing, or as the as the soils dry out, okay, we, CO2 actually goes down during this period. That promotes soil carbonate. It gets hotter. That promotes soil carbonate. Uh, CO, so CO2 goes down, water goes down, uh, soil temperature goes up. All of those promote soil carbonate. We expect, we don't know for sure, we're measuring this uh, in some experiments now, but that soil carbonate formation should take place in the hottest time of the year in this environment. And we see here that actually is basically 10 degrees Celsius higher than the modern. So those really hot temperatures are, are actually possible to get. So not the hottest temperature, but the average temperature for a year for three different sites. So we looked at this in a forest up at Illoret, and it's sort of a forest. It's actually just a bunch of trees along the edge of a, along the edge of a laga, and in the bush and in the open areas have a difference in temperature of about six degrees Celsius. Likewise, Samburu, with a, it's a little bit higher, so it has a cooler temperature. Again, seven degrees Celsius hotter in the open than in the forest, and a little less, four degrees in Nairobi. So we see these open areas are much hotter, and so at least we have a better feeling that perhaps this is telling us something real. And then the other interesting thing, that thing that was really useful is we decided to put these temperature pendants at a, at a series of temperature, at a series of depths. So we measured them, we, we did uh, about uh, 40 or so sites where we measured them at five centimeters, at 15, at 25 centimeters depth. And these are the curves that we observed. So red is at five centimeters. Okay, this is just a typical day. And green is at 15 centimeters, again, Typical day. So the amplitude is falling as we go down in the soil. Okay, now what we can do is, is and I always, you know, tell, tell people like me who, you know, appreciate math but really don't do it as well as, as I wish I could, is to make friends with a geophysicist. And so I, you know, talked to Dave Chapman, my colleague who works in heat flow, and he says, well, we, We've solved a similar sort of thing, and it'll just take a while to reprogram, and let's see what we can do. And we can actually calculate, a, we can actually the input function that reproduces these three curves. So this dotted line is the surface skin temperature that produces the red lines, and you notice that this is up over 60 degrees Celsius, okay? But we have to reproduce all three of those curves, and um, we can do this every day of the year for every single site. So here's a site that we did in the grassland in an open bush area and in a forested area. And the green represents every single day of the year, you know, the up and down of the forest temperature, the up and down of the bush area, and the blue is the up and down of the daily. So we've taken these temperature profiles and figured out the daily skin surface of the earth that produces the, the soil at depth. So um, uh, Will Mace, my student working on this with me, said, well, let's composite these, and we'll call this a composite day for three months of the year. And this is what it looks like for Meru. So this is what the skin surface of the earth looks like to reproduce the soils on average for three months. So in the riparian forest, this is the temperature structure. And in the bushland, this is the temperature structure. And in the grassland, this is the temperature structure. So it gets up to, and these envelopes are one sigma distributions. So it occasionally gets up to 60 degrees Celsius. And in Turkana, where it's even hotter than Meru, up to 70 degrees Celsius is very common. And I know Andrew Hill, who's sitting somewhere in the room here, can testify to that, that you know, people have burned their feet, literally burned their feet, uh, when they are newcomers and arrive and don't realize how hot the ground can be. And they think, oh, I'll just go down to the lake. And they're sorry. So 
come back to the question of were these guys sitting in the shade when they were making these. So let's at least consider a time of day that is, let's just, I mean, if 40 degrees Celsius is your cutoff, OK? Then if you're in the open grassland, at midnight it's dark, and it keeps, and it's still dark, and it gets a little cooler until about 6.30 in the morning, and then the sun comes up, and by about 9 o'clock in the morning, it's 40 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees, and it gets up to over to 60 degrees Celsius, and then it comes down again, and about 5 o'clock at night, it gets down to 40, and then it gets dark. Okay, so if these guys are in the open, they have only this window of time in which they are not in the shade. And it also, so my feeling is that if hominids are, were, they at least had to be as smart as goats. So here's goats in the middle of the day, and you see they're all in the shade. So now we know where hominids were every hour of the day, <coughs> or at least we can put some constraints on where they might be. Um, so another thing that we worry about is aridity, how hot or dry or something is it. And um, our notion, conceptual model, working with Naomi Levin, was that we could uh, look at uh, oxygen 18. And we know that uh, meteoric water doesn't really know very well about how dry it is, rainwater. Uh, but lakes, as they evaporate, lose the light isotope, so they become rich in the heavy isotope. And the drier it is, the more enriched they become. So what would be nice would be to look at some system that looks at the difference between meteoric water and evaporated water. Now, it turns out that some lakes are so small, you could hardly call them a lake. And, and botanists call those leaves. Okay, so leaf, a leaf is a microscopic lake. Okay, so then if we consider, well, if there's something that can preserve that signal of the leaves, because it's a water source, then one way to do would be to consider this difference. And so what we did is subtracted hippopotamuses from giraffes. So our paleoridity index is start with a giraffe, subtract one hippopotamus, and you have aridity. <laughs> All right? Uh, and so we've calibrated this by looking at areas with both hippos and giraffes. In This is only river hippos. Uh, Turkana is the most evaporated. This is from the lower Omo hippos and giraffes. And as we get down to in fact, a grazing or a, a, a browsing, uh, or, uh, actually the Okapi giraffe in the Ituri forest. So we find this isotope separation collapses uh, or is much, much smaller as we get to more and drier and drier areas. So the water deficit is the difference between the precipitation, okay, so evapotranspiration, potential evapotranspiration minus precipitation. So, um, <coughs> In modern terms, okay, we've seen Turkana, Savo, Nairobi, Ituri Forest. And in the fossil record, we basically get most of our samples are in between the hottest and some areas that are still fairly dry. So we're not finding evidence for mesic environments. Vegetation, we've really pretty much already talked to, and we've talked about the, the biomes. Um, so we don't see any of this kind of stuff, no, no evidence of forest. We see everything in this region. We know there are rivers, so perhaps very small, narrow riparian corridors uh, could explain these things. So the last thing I want to turn to is, is diets. And um, look at our foods, go to the grocery store, get some nice healthy foods, C3 foods, nice healthy C4 foods. Uh, and uh, 
So everything over here, these are, these are all C3 foods. This is teff, the Ethiopian flatbread, and some guys collecting teff in the field. Um, so again, we can use this isotope distinction. You are what you eat plus a few per mil. And um, look at what the homonyms ate. So th there's a story, a, a, a lesson for some graduate students that are here. When I first wanted to do this, uh, I wrote to Neve Leakey in 1990, because I was going over to East Africa. I said, we got this great thing. We can do paleo diets of animals. Let me have some fossils. So she said, OK, you, know, you, you can have whatever we collect in a one-week period, everything you can take. So great, because we've already collected all the stuff we want from this area, and this are the, these are the scraps. So um, we, and, and to me, by Christmas, I had demonstrated that this was fine. So it took um, another 10 years to convince the scientific community that actually tooth enamel was recording paleo diets. And then it took another 10 years to convince the museum people that I should be able to sample hominid fossils. So it was 20 years from the inception to being able to carry it out. And, and, and in defense of the museum, I'll say that except for the past five years, the last five years, the first 15 years, we definitely were damaging their fossils more than I liked. But in that last little bit, I remember when the museum curator said, now where did you take the sample? And I knew that I had them. So, <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, uh, the first stuff that we did with uh, Paranthropus. So this is Omo Turkana, Beringo, Peninge, Olduvai. It's about 1,000 kilometers north to south over a limited time window. And it's this uh, Paranthropus boisei nutcracker man. Uh, Nick van der Merve had just published some results suggesting that these guys were eating C4 plants. And uh, it was not, not well received for a variety of reasons. And so we thought, well, we'll just try this on all the samples that we are allowed to sample from Turkana Basin. Uh, so this is the Nutcracker Man, and he has this big sagittal crest on his head and big diameter teeth. So that's, that's their teeth. And this is our little beansy tiny teeth, the same tooth. Uh, thick enamel, uh, speculated diet, tubers, nuts, seeds, various sort of things. Uh, so in 2007, uh, Bernard Wood and authors wrote about 50 years of evidence and analysis. So, so far, there had been a lot of speculation, 50 years of speculation, and, uh, and no isotope stuff. So, wow, what do we get? 22 individuals. It was expected that it would be in this area, and it was uh, quite clear and fortunately a rather small distribution of delta C13 values very narrow distribution of diets that can only place it in C4 land. These guys were competing with zebras and warthogs for diets, not competing with uh, anything in the browser um, spectra of thing or even in the non-grass herbaceous vegetation. These guys were almost very close to pure grazers and may have been pure grazers. Um, <coughs> <coughs> I remember I took this picture some years ago uh, before we did this work of these baboons sitting in this grassy field. They're picking out the corms, which are the underground reproductive uh, organs of these, because they're full of nutrients. And uh, I don't really know yet what Paranthropus was eating, but it, they're probably doing more like this and having to eat in that environment than in any Certainly not. They were not eating in any closed habitats. Uh, when we finished that, we got the go-ahead from the National Museums of Kenya to sample the rest of the hominins in the museum that had broken teeth. So we only worked on broken teeth. Um, and, and last year, we came out with this series of papers uh, on early hominin diets. Um, this is just an example of one of the broken teeth. And that's the sample. 
afterwards, after I've collected it. And this is the surface before we collected the sample and the surface after we collected the sample. So, um, so, so, so that's, at least for this isotope analysis, what we're, what we're doing. So all the hominin diets from four million years ago, we find the earliest one, Australopithecine onamensis, is down here in C3 land. Uh, uh, Artipithecus uh, is not shown here, but Artipithecus is a tiny little bit older and essentially the same isotope values. By the time we get to Australopithecine afarensis, this is not, this is actually the sample from Kenya, which the local paleontologists call Kenyantipus platyops, has a very wide isotope range, and it's actually identical to the isotope range of Afarensis. A suggestion that maybe this is two populations, we're not sure, two diet populations, we're not sure. Uh, but clearly, uh, by two million years ago, we've split into two different diet categories. This is the Homo group, and the blue is the Paranthropus group. So this is the big nutcracker man with the large sagittal crest, and this is Homo, uh, and, and that's, what, that's what the isotopes are telling. So now we're at the position, and when we wrote this paper, we decided, okay, we are not going to speculate in this paper what the guys were actually eating. We're going to let the, the isotope analyses speak to them, speak out loud. If you want to complain about this paper, complain about our analyses, we won't actually speculate on the diet except C3-based versus C4-based. But so now we can actually begin to speculate. And, uh, and again, that's where I know that I'll get in trouble with paleontologists and paleoanthropologists. Um, but this is the evidence any diets have to fit now into this isotope space. Okay, so um, we... At four million years ago, we're, it's eating pure C3 foods. It's not closed canopy foods. We have an isotope signature that tells about closed canopy foods. It's definitely not closed canopy foods. We have, by three and a half million years ago, these two hominins leading to us, presumably, both had quite a variety, a very wide range of a mixed C3 and C4 diet. And by two million years ago, we split into Homo. It's about 50% C4 based in Paranthropus, about 80% C4 based, moving up another half million years. Both of them increase a small amount in C4 based resources. Uh, and uh, now we need, we need more samples to look at what happens after that. Okay, so uh, in, in kind of summary, uh, isotopes have been really helpful in telling us things that probably is a, a habitat that looks like more like this with maybe a repair, with a narrow riparian corridor, okay, that makes up only a few percent of the total depositional landscape. Okay, remember a depositional landscape is the entire width of the depositional region, uh, which today in the OMO is about 30 kilometers wide, <clears throat> was mostly hot and dry. And, uh, and it's very clear that the early hominins from three and a half million years ago to present were using extensively savanna resources in their diets. So if they're eating it, they had to be out, out in it. There could be some other things that stay, that, that stay in any repairing corridor, but it was not our it was not the hominins from three and a half million to present. And then lastly, we can actually begin to think about how they could possibly parse their time, use their time, uh, in, by thinking of things in this notion of a composite day and what sort of temperature, uh, temperature uh, regimes they'd experience. Again, not air temperature measured by a thermometer or by a weather station, but the real temperature is measured by the bottoms of your feet. Uh, okay, so um, I'll just close with one of my favorite images of a bar in the small town of Archer's Post showing another view of hominin evolution coming out of the trees. And, and, and that's an artist's rendition. And uh, I'll just close with that because 
There's always people who think that I lead them astray. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, that's all I'm saying. So. <clears throat> Is there a difference in the thickness of the enamel that you sampled between whatever you were able to get a hold of? What I'm thinking is that certainly our metabolic system is very similar. It really hasn't changed. We still have teeth. They still have three different um, materials in there, all calcium phosphate. But what I'm interested in, did the actual enamel change in composition and was it thicker or thinner, depending uh, it, on what they ate? Um, it, so the Paranthropus boisei, the ones with the really large sagittal crests, have really, really thick enamel. enamel. And in some cases, in really old individuals, you could see that they'd gone through all of it. So uh, yes, there's a, there's a definite evolution in the morphology of the teeth, including the thickness of of, of the enamel following through on that is there's previously there's been a bunch of studies done on microware of some of these early hominin teeth. Um, but when, when we came out with the Paranthropus thing, it was such a surprise to everyone that I think we just need to start all over with the microware and say, well, now, you know, what, what is it really telling us? Because, you know, you did it on these guys for many years and it, you got it wrong. So, and if you really, Andrew Hill will really be able to tell you about the morphology of teeth. Yes, every detail. Um, so, <laughs> this traditional picture in my mind is that uh, in the early Pliocene, uh, climate in East Africa was relatively wet, and then it became more and more arid, and that contributed or pushed uh, human evolution. So is this picture wrong, according to this uh, uh, work? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'd say that uh, you know, 50 years ago, there was a notion of the, oh, the savannas opened up in the late Miocene. And then about 25 years ago, that fell into great disfavor. And I'd say that this looks much more like the original notion of 50 years ago, that you know, it, looks, it looks like an open habitat. It's not the same open habitat as today. And I think one of the things that we uh, need to realize is that C4 grasses today make up 50% of the net primary productivity in the tropics. So 50% of photosynthesis on land is C4 plants. At 10 million years ago, it was less than 1%. We have no fossils. There's not a single grass fossil in the last 10 million years from tropical Africa or elsewhere that I know of. So they also were undergoing an extraordinarily um, evolutionary binge, as it were. And right now, we don't know what was going on. We have some evidence from genetics that, oh, some things were happening, but the timing is terrible because, you know, it's basically tied to whenever you think the first grasses evolved or the first grasses showed up with a linear genetic variation in between. So I, I, I think if we can figure out a way to understand what's happening within the grasses, we might have a much better idea of... What about the dust record from East Africa? I don't remember the timing, but uh, again, in my mind, it seems that the dust record indicated it was less dusty, and then uh, the amount of dust in the record is increasing, coming towards the present. A little bit, yeah, somewhat more, but I don't. It suggested that the conditions were at least wet uh, somewhere. Yeah, and, and the, most of the dust record is coming off of the Sahara. It's not coming off of, you know, what. We're trying to describe what is this area where we know we have the hominid fossils, not what was somewhere else where we don't have the hominid fossils. There was a dust record from Peter Manapal and it's from yeah. the Atlantic yeah. Ocean. 
Ja. En zo in dat de dust van, ja. van de Sahara in ja. en dat van East-Afrika. Ja. Zo. Ja. Zo, dus evolution of C4 diets, dat is dat je interpret, of je niet interpreting, maar dat uh, reflects uh, better hunting skills? Um, so we have two hominins at two million years ago. Okay, at least one of them was definitely hunting, or at least not hunting, but at least uh, butchering animals. Whether they hunted them or not, or managed to just scare off lions and and and, and be scavengers. But so there was definitely uh, at least one of them was using was using meat. And if I have my guess, it'd be the human ones that were doing that. Um, the other interesting thing to me is that if you look at the history of grazing in Africa, uh, at two million years ago, we had two grazing elephants in Africa. They're both gone. Okay, one, one became a, a browser. Uh, we had uh, two, or we had three grazing pigs. Okay, and now there's only one grazing pig in the entire continent. We had one grazing giraffe. And that became extinct. We had two grazing, I, th I think the Paranthropus was probably a grazer. There was also a, a giant primate baboon called Therapithecus. It was also a grazer. Basically, the non bovid grazers have been pushed out of the picture. They've been, they're, they're almost all gone. It's, on the, it's a, almost as if the, that at, at two million years ago, we were still at least down to the final four. And, and going to see what was happened. But now, it's basically the bovids have, have pushed, I think, it could be the bovids have pushed all the other grazers out of the picture. So, so you would, you would, you know, if they weren't hunters, you, you wouldn't be able to see, or scavengers, you'd be able to see, uh, see that on their tooth enamel, wouldn't you? If they were eating C4 plants, isn't that an abrasive? Uh, it is abrasive, but there's a lot of other abrasive things too. And the most abrasive thing is sand. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so if you do something with your, I remember I was going, only a geologist who's a little crazy would do that. I was going through elephant poop one day. I was going, analyzing elephant feces for, and I came across these samples that were extraordinarily low in carbon. I thought that's extraordinary. And it turned out that these, for this, 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 uh, for a short period of time, the feces were about 25% sand. <laughs> but it was right at the beginning of the rainy season when they're having a hard, they pull up trees and their shrub, uh, grasses and they whack them on their foot to get rid of the dirt. They still eat the rest. But I mean, that's a really abrasive mm -hmm. diet. So we do find that, I mean, that's just the, passing example that you get sand in your, everybody knows what sand in your picnic food is like. <clears throat> so, but, uh, and, you know, Andrew probably has different opinions on this than I do. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Andrew, but you were there my first field season uh, in Africa. <laughs> uh, but, um, um, now I forgot where I was going. Sand, sand, sand in the picnic Weary. food. That's yeah, weird. yeah. Well, but, but, oh, but the, the, the microware or the, the microware diet story just has not mm -hmm. proven to be interpretable, and I think it needs to be completely reconsidered, and in, 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 certainly in the context of what stable isotopes are saying, because they've done it and they got it 180 degrees wrong, as wrong as you could get. Because they did not, nobody had suggested C4 grasses in the diet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Helen. So, over this whole interval that you're looking at, all those hominin things are already bipedals? Uh, yes, for this. So, that means, I mean, if they ever moved from some ancestor in a tree or so, that happened way before. So, right, so the Artipithecus is one that is 
being argued as to where exactly it's being in the bipedality. It's definitely in C3 diet space. And as early as. You have no way of view, view forest and how it would have in uh, not, not based on, not based on the isotope evidence. If you want that evidence, you've got to, and then we have to explain the isotope evidence, how you can. Yeah, I mean, so they're trying to fix it. Yeah. But all those things are written by people, so I mean, yeah. they were living So these were definitely, yeah. everything that I showed was definitely bipedal. Yeah. They're yeah. still Yeah. But they still can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but they, they were written. Yeah. yeah. I find your uh, observation that the, all these grazers suffer disproportionately, and yet that's the new world that's emerging ecologically, right? All these C4 grasses are coming to dominance, and it looks like Paranthropus is far better suited to that than we are. Like, where'd they go? I mean, I know you uh, want to attribute this to bobids, but I can't help but thinking, given that far more monkeys die at the hands of other monkeys than they do from all predation combined. Yeah. You, know, you forget the lions and tigers and bears. It's us yeah. you have to watch out for. And do you think that those paranthropists with this high C4 component that reflects that they're eating animals that are eating C4 or that they are themselves we, 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 the we can't say based on the isotope evidence and we have to go to some other method. And the, Microware has, you know, I think let us, you know, certainly do a lot of arguments, but it, you know, it, it really got things pretty well wrong. And so, Apparently. right now we have to figure, okay, let's find some other evidence. We've put up this. Now we say, okay, now what do we do to distinguish between these, these possible different things? It's almost certainly C4 grasses or um, C4 eating animals or eating animals. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and then if it's eating animals, we can say, okay, well, what animals? And, 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 and there's also crickets and things. There's also a lot of insects that could play very important in this. Well, let's imagine if we look at the animals on the landscape, okay, there's, let's say, tiny animals, small animals. Not quite, but almost all of the small mammals are C3. So it has to be Big animals. It has to be animals bigger than about 20 kilos. And speaking against this robust tooth morphology, then making well, large well, animals. Yeah. A, right, uh, but it'd have to. It, we seem to be able to handle that very right, well. Right, they'd have. They'd have teeth, the know. C4 animals that they, the C4 animals available are big. They're pigs, and they're bovids, big bovids. It has to be bigger than, like I say, 20 kilos. Because all basically almost all of the mammals smaller than about uh, 20 kilos are C3. There's a few you can find an occasional, you know, specialized mouse or something that does. So unless you're a cooperative big so game hunter, right? So unless you're, right. it'd have to be large animals. So and and then that's fine. But mm -hmm. the, but again, that's a constraint that we can that we can we can talk about. So if you want it to be animals, if you want it to be mammals. It has to be large mammals. It has to be large. Yeah. That's really interesting. Rel relatively large. The microwave shows that they weren't eating the way they hoped. I mean, they weren't processing both. Yeah. Uh, so that they're not eating. I don't think they'd be eating large animals. Well, no, that's very obvious in our records that they were eating both. That's a very poor study. But it's striking, though, you think that this new world dominated by the C4 plants and Paranthropus is up there doing a way better job than we are in terms of where they go. Yeah. And termites are C4, aren't they? Some termites are C4. It depends on, but I, yeah. I have a question. Uh, I'll ask the clumped isotopes question. Oh, no. So I'm looking at this picture, and the soil is pretty whitish. What makes the soil at 50 centimeter uh, depth so warm? And how does that translate to what oh, the actual the, air temperature is? Uh, we have to go backwards. Oopsie. I went the wrong way. 
Um, <clears throat> so the, the, basically the, the problem is that in the tropics, things heat up very fast and they cool down very slowly. So we have more heating. So we usually think about the daily soil temperature in terms of a sine wave. But it's not a sine wave. It's, 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 it, it's significantly distorted, where we have a high rate of heating and a slow rate of cooling. And so it's very asymmetric, and we get way, way hotter than the mean temperature. OK, and that's just because of the, the absorption of heat by the surface of the soil. Even so, the soil is pretty light. Yeah. But so if we put a weather station in each of those environments, it gives us the same temperature. That's what weather stations are designed to do. They're designed to be always in the shade and reflect as much sunlight away as possible. So a weather station in the forest, in the bush, or in the open actually will give you the same air temperature. So that's what makes it tricky is, is we need to now figure out the next step and figure out, well, if we want to relate it to mean annual temperature, what do we want? How, how are we going to do that? And, and is, is that, I mean, yes, it's something we would want. But we'd also, I'd love to have the, 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 the mean annual temperature. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have the soil temperature, the mean annual soil temperature. And I'd like to have um, the temperature on the 1st of July every right. year. You know. So then the fossil soil temperature and the modern soil temperatures are similar? Yeah. At least that far we can say. Yeah. Mm. Let's thank Thuri again.